You are listening to Medicine and the Machine with Medscape Editor-in-Chief Eric Topol and Master Storyteller and Clinician Abraham Verghese as they talk with experts around the globe about the hottest topics in healthcare. This podcast is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only. Hello, I'm Eric Topol, uh, and I'm with my colleague Abraham Verghese, uh, co-host for Medicine and the Machine podcast. Today, we welcome... Uh, Professor uh, Caitlin Jettelina, who is uh, a phenomenal epidemiologist from the University of Texas at Houston, and who is going to enlighten us about her role, the local, your local epidemiologist in the pandemic. So welcome, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, you know, it's really interesting how uh, We've had a chance to to meet, and uh, to I've also long before that saw some of your great insightful writings about the pandemic. And can you kind of uh, give us about a bit about your background and how somehow you landed as one of our guiding lights for explaining the pandemic and providing insights for everyone? Yeah, you know, it's been a very organic. Um, a journey, I will say, uh, and something that I have would never even dreamed of doing Um, in the beginning of the pandemic. So I actually used to work at the WHO. And so the beginning of the pandemic, I was really following the raw data closely and my colleagues knew that. And so they asked me if I could give them um, uh, daily updates, you know, just a few sentences on what the heck was going on. Um, and not just my faculty, uh, but also staff and students, um, because uh, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of anxiety. And so I started an email. It was probably about 30 people. I called them my daily data-driven updates, and I signed it, love your local epidemiologist, because I was <laughs> their local one. Um, <clears throat> and then a few days later, my uh, one of my students came up to me and asked me if I could start sharing it on Facebook so she could share it with her friends and family. And so I started a Facebook page, it was just called Your Local Epidemiologist. I, in the beginning, I was updating it every day of just what I was seeing. So these were primary data analyses, me following what was going on. And then it ended up growing and growing and growing. And uh, last I pulled the data, I have a have reached about 130 million people in two years. Wow. And so, it's been just this wild journey, <laughs> um, and uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. You know, in your non-epidemiologist life, you're a busy mom with two very young kids. So I, I think our, our listeners are always curious, how do you get this done? How do you juggle all these things to write such a beautiful newsletter and keep up with Twitter and do all the things you do? Yeah, you know, well, first of all, I, I couldn't do it without a support system whatsoever. Um, I, we have our grandparents down the street that help babysit. Um, my husband is completely supportive of this, and I do it in my free time. Once the girls go to sleep, I read up, I write a post in about an hour, and then it goes live in the morning. I mean, it's it's been... Um, it, like I said, it's very off the cusp, um, organic, and kind of just going with the flow and what I'm kind of thinking in my head as we go. And I think that people appreciate that, um, that it's not too curated. I will say I do now have a copy editor because everyone got annoyed of my uh, spelling mistakes. <laughs> so I've been learning over time, but um, it's, it's yeah, I, I kind of just find the time. You know, I would be doing this inside my brain, regardless if I had a newsletter or not. So I figured just, you know, put my thoughts to paper and see how it goes. Well, you mentioned uh, about the two young children and uh, recently there was this pretty major disappointment regarding the inability to go forward with vaccinations for kids less than age five. Can you tell us about your reactions? You've reviewed what we know about the data, what's missing and what this, uh, what the implications of this change was all about? Yeah, I, uh, w- I think we're all incredibly shocked. Um, this entire process for the Ender Fives is completely unprecedented. You know, if the FDA, in my eyes, if 
the Pfizer and FDA had enough data to move forward with submitting an EUA application, I felt like it was pretty in the bag that they're going to have that scientific external committee meeting the next week and that they canceled at last minute. Um, and we were, I think we're all shocked. I was shocked. I, as a mom, I was incredibly disappointed. Um, as an epidemiologist, I uh, was very confused and I think I am still confused of what was going on. And I think as a scientific communicator, my biggest concern is losing the confidence of the process among parents. Um, we know already that kids aren't getting vaccinated. You know, I think only what 30% of five to 11 year olds are vaccinated. And so we need to be as transparent as possible and explain and communicate what's going on very carefully and diligently to the public. And unfortunately, I haven't seen that happen yet. Yeah, just to pick up on that. So you're really, uh, I think, appropriately emphasizing that we've done a very poor job of getting children age five to 11 vaccinated, which has been available for months, uh, far lower than what would be expected, uh, especially when the safety and the concerns about myocarditis are just not there. I mean, I think the last review I saw, there was 12 cases total out of several million doses, and those cases all were very self-limited. And that's uh, an incredibly low rate of the only really feared side effect uh, in those young, in those kids. Now, here, uh, the dose was lowered even more to promote safety. And in my, in my understanding was that uh, this was, as you say, unprecedented because they were going to give um, a, a green light for an emergency authorization for the two shot data that didn't have enough uh, efficacy uh, with the third dose because they had to go ahead with this third dose uh, pending still. Now, that seems really odd. The, the options would have been, well, why don't you reload, reload with a different dose uh, and, and do a two-shot trial? Who wants to give kids three shots if they can get two? Or you know, why don't you just sit and wait till you have the data? So the whole thing was bizarre. And I, I agree with you. You're making a, a critical point that what is this going to do when they are vaccines are eventually rolled out to these even younger children, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I think it's very unfortunate too, you know, because we, as I'll talk as my, with my parent hat on, you know, December, when we got the news that the clinical trial failed, we were all disappointed, but I felt like, you know, we had this new goalpost of, we all knew it was going to be next summer. So we'll just, we'll make it through next summer. And then to then, a month later say, oh, we may actually have the data. Maybe the goalpost has changed. And then it has just been a very confusing ride. And I actually am very well versed in clinical trials. So I couldn't even imagine um, the parents out there that aren't and uh, feel you know, pretty hopeless right now and very confused. One of your uh, lovely quotes is that reality is not binary. Uh, and I love that. And I think you've done a Great job of helping the public to understand that. And I imagine, I always ask this of Eric, that you also get a lot of pushback by folks who do believe that reality is binary. So how do you personally handle that? I mean, must have, that must have been a shock that came along with your, with your, your prominence and your, you know, your celebrity status, to, to really put it frankly. I don't know if I handle it well. Um, I, you know, it's, I, I think it's a reality of a public facing person um, and being uh, an epidemiologist or a public health official in all of this um, is you're kind of right smack in the middle of the conversation. Um, it's certainly nothing. I mean, I never thought this newsletter was going to get as big as it is. And so I certainly didn't expect the, the negative that also comes with that positive. Um, I feel like I have built a pretty tough skin. Um, there are crazy people out there, but I think that the majority of people really truly appreciate just some level of communication um, to tell them what's going on because that gap isn't being filled well at all um, in the United States or across the world. And so I always just try and focus on the silent majority um, that keep opening up those emails and, um, and you know, try to give myself some grace along the way, uh, though it's tough. 
I'm actually right now in a um, holding pattern with my newsletter. I gave myself a week or two break of just not writing because it, it was time for one. Well, you know, that brings me to that very interesting closing that you have in your newsletters, because in a world of social media with all sorts of viciousness, uh, you sign it each time, love your local epidemiologist. There's not a lot of love out there, it doesn't seem. And I wonder if you could comment about that, because <laughs> I don't see anybody signing with love anymore. Yeah, you know, I never really thought twice about it until I went on, uh, I talked to Andy Slavik's uh, podcast, and he brought that up. And, oh, oh. you know, the same thing, the same comment as you, Eric. And um, I guess it's something that I've always just done. I want people to know that I care. Um, I care enough to do this on my off time and to um, try and digest the tsunami of information um, because, you know, it goes back to the roots of I was I'm doing this for my friends and family, which keeps getting bigger and bigger, um, which I love. And so so, yeah, I, I, I hope that it makes it more personalized. I hope that it puts a face um, to the words and to the public health. Um, so people can have a trusted messenger and um, someone to turn to for really the scientific perspective. But other than that, I, I haven't really thought about it. I just continue to do it. And um, I feel like I need some sort of closure on the posts. Reading your newsletter, I'm, I'm struck by how much it contrasts with the sort of official stuff that comes from the CDC and elsewhere, presumably because they have to sort of do this very carefully vetted kind of speaking, but as a result, they they wind up, you know, sowing more and more confusion. And your your letter is really, your newsletter is really quite gratifying to read because it it not only conveys the love, it's also very simple, simply put, and in ways that all of us can understand. It brings me to a question that I want to ask both of you because I think it's very much on our minds and again in that non-binary area, which is the effect of prior COVID infection in our calculations on, you know, where we're heading. I know Eric's been writing a lot about this and you've thought about it too. So I'd like to ask both of you about that, where you think that fits in. Well, Eric, you just had an amazing post about this on your own newsletter with a lot of the data. Yeah, there's a lot more coming out today on that, um, both from Israel and the UK. I mean, I think it's unequivocal that prior um, infection uh, provides a level of immunity. We wouldn't want anybody to go out and get COVID. They're, we're not talking about chicken pox parties with COVID. It would be reckless. But if you happen to have a, a confirmed infection with proof of that, it seems that that should be um, good for getting uh, credit. Uh, and I, I believe the one and done that we used to say with J&J, &J, which isn't true, of course, but one and done applies to prior COVID or natural immunity and a shot. If we could just convert those people, so the, the, the resistant ones, to get them to have a shot, they would be in the same protective level, even with Omicron, as three shots. And so the divisiveness, I, mean, I don't know what you think, Caitlin, I'm really interested in your thoughts because you look at data and I love how data driven you are. Uh, what you think about whether that's sound because we are uh, held up in this country by the reasonable thinking against mandates, because a lot of these people who are taking the question about mandates, they say, I had COVID. I have some immunity. Why don't I get recognized for that? And the CDC uh, has tunnel vision and does not accept in any way recognize that, uh, that there is such a thing as natural immunity. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I think I, I agree that the data is showing that some level of the infection induced immunity um, is protecting. I, I think the United States, if we're in particular, if we're talking about policy, would make it really difficult because we just don't have the health system where we have that all documented. Um, and so, uh, you know, how I don't know if you're going to have a concert and count a previous positive test as an, a vac you know, as the same as vaccination. Well, we don't necessarily have that proof unless people kind of just print out their test results. And so it's, I think it's a little more messy in the United States as it is uh, than compared to like Israel, the UK or whatever. 
but it is what it is. You know, I, I think that this question, uh, you know, how much will Omicron infection help is critical for where this pandemic is going to be going in the next waves, right? Because if Omicron, it, we think it touched about 40% of Americans, this level of immunity combined with vaccinations will no doubt help build that immunity wall. Um, there is a really interesting study that came out, I think yesterday or the day before from South Africa, showing how um, an Omicron infection without vaccination um, protects really well against Omicron, but not so well against other variants of concern. And so another piece I think of a the important uh, puzzle is how is this gonna thing gonna continue to mutate? Because um, a lot of uh, viral uh, evolutionary scientists, and I know one is at Eric Tobel's lab, um, but there, it looks like the mutations have been very random. They're not a ladder like that we would expect. Now, if this virus continues to mutate off of the Omicron, I think that's great news because that means all of those 40% of Americans that were infected will be protected. The question is, will it continue to mutate off Omicron? Or are we just going to get some random one come off again like we did with Omicron or Delta? And I, I don't know. No one knows. Um, but that's certainly something that I'll be paying attention to because it has major implications for where this pandemic goes. Yeah. And just to get back to your point about the kind of messiness of our health system, I did a, a lobby in August, the CDC, to recognize prior COVID as one dose, equivalent to one dose. And their response was just like yours. Well, how are we going to prove it? Well, people, if they want, if they want to get credit, they can come up with their test yeah. result. And the point here is that I'm not suggesting in any way that people with natural immunity alone is adequate. I'm saying that they have to have at least one shot. The point here is that we have a 64% fully vaccinated, fully is, should be three shot, right? But a uh, two shot vaccinated rate in this country, 64%. And if we could get a lot of those people out there that have had confirmed prior COVID to get one shot, that just has to help. The other thing, of course, is getting prior COVID doesn't uh, uh, protect from long COVID, obviously. Uh, and so in fact, vaccines do to some degree. I, I wonder what your thoughts are for all the data about vaccination protecting from long COVID, do you, how much do you give a, a sense that that's a real protection? I think it is. I think that um, there's been some, you know, four or five-ish solid studies that show that significant, I mean, it's not 100% reduction in long COVID, but we're talking about like 0.5% compared to 30% or something. So there's a lot of protection that vaccines do. I will say, I don't know, and I, I'm sure I could have missed it. I don't, I haven't seen many studies that show that um, or ask the question of does infection induced immunity protect against long COVID? And I think that's a really important question to be asking too. And I don't know if I've seen that data, but yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything there. Um, yeah. I, the other question that I guess that uh, Abraham was uh, getting at too, and you, you touched on, we don't know much about Omicron and long COVID either. Um, so this whole idea about prior uh, uh, infection-induced immunity, and then as a function of different strains of the virus, especially the one that we're just going through now, seems like that's still a lot up in the air. Well, especially since this one, um, Omicron, uh, induces a very different disease pathology than Delta, right? So um so the implications it can have on long COVID, on how long that immunity lasts, on B cells, on T cells, I mean, it could be very different than before. Um, not necessarily bad, but different. And those implications are crucial um, for when we are going to get this next wave um, or if this is just going to kind of uh, burn out. I want to circle back to one of the things that makes you quite unique, and that is that you're the mother of two young children. And I, I wondered, what is your sense for the level of, of wariness or acceptance of a vaccine in that age group in general? And what was your own thought process? And let's assume that we do get a vaccine that is safe and successful there. 
How well do you think it will be received uh, by parents? Um, so I'll answer, I guess, from my perspective is it's going to be very well received by me. Um, it's something that I've been looking forward to. I think as a lot of parents, it's it feels like it's the finish line. Um, and that's why it hurts so much when it's um, pushed back. And as a parent, as an epidemiologist, I, I very much recognize that we got very lucky that kids are having a lot more mild disease than uh, adults. Um, but it's still, you know, kids aren't supposed to die. They're not supposed to go to the hospital. And so it continues to be a top 10 leading cause of death. And if I, as a parent, can protect my kid as much as I can from that, then I want to. Now, I think it's going to be a little more, a little more difficult uh, for the, you know, parents as a whole, maybe 20, 25% of parents will line up just like we saw with the five to 11 year olds. Um, and that may not be able to be budged a lot um, because of hesitancy because of misinformation and because of thinking that the virus is more mild for kids. It's something I continue to look forward to and very much so once we actually can see this data that no, none of us have seen yet um, from Pfizer. Uh, you and I uh, had a chance to write together uh, a piece uh, in Substack about the pan-coronavirus uh, vaccine and I wanted to get your updated thoughts about that, Caitlin, as to um, is it important? Should we push harder on it? Is it possible? What could it do for us? Yeah, you know, I think that's one, one of the more exciting, innovative uh, p biomedical technology that's come out of this pandemic is the movement of this type of virus. You know, a variant um, proof virus is uh, very cool and would be solve a lot of our problems right now. Um, I think that it's going to have to take time to see that effectiveness data. Uh, I think, though, it may be the next generation of vaccines that we do roll out. Um, I so I, you know, I think they're still in their phase two. Uh, for that army vaccine. Um, but that means that results should be coming in in the next few months. And I'll be very curious to see uh, what they show. Yeah, there's a lot of candidates out there. The one that you just mentioned from Walter Reed is the first one out in a phase two trial with a different nanoparticle. But of course, there's many that are trying to stimulate very broad neutralizing antibodies. Um, yeah, so it is an exciting area, which I hope that we'll see uh, later this year to help get us uh, to a state where we don't have to keep using the original vaccines that were directed to a virus that's so different than what we are dealing with right now. And yeah, and I really think that type of vaccine is going to get us out of this reactive response into a much more proactive. Um, you know, right now the discussion is, do we need an Omicron specific vaccine? Well, you know, Omicron waves is almost done. Is this the direction it's going to mutate? We don't know. And so we keep having this reactive response. And I think a virus or a vaccine like that would kind of get us out of that rut. Um, and really, truly uh, one of the silver linings of this pandemic is how much team science has gone on, how much advancement there's gone on in medicine and science. It's really absolutely incredible and really cool uh, to watch uh, in real time. You know, I was uh, struck by the, one of the very useful tables in your newsletter that sort of gave us guidance on how to decide about whether to mask indoors, outdoors, based on testing prevalence, you know, very useful. But as I read it, I thought, this is useful to people who read it. And, and yet there's a huge segment of the public who have made up their mind on things like that. You know, they already have decided. And, and my question is, in public health, in your academic life, do you see the sort of the science doubters, the, you know, the sort of the naysayers, is that being treated as the public health problem that it really is? I mean, is that being addressed with the same tools that we bring to everything else? Because in a way, that's been the biggest issue in the epidemic, at least in America. Uh, yeah, it's. I think I would argue it's the biggest problem we have in our response to this pandemic. Um, and no, uh, not enough has been uh, directed to uh, addressing that or fixing it. Um, 
you know, the Biden administration and the Office of Science and Technology last summer put out a plan for pandemic preparedness and uh, communication or fighting this, the disinformation uh, campaign was one little line in this uh, pages and pages plan. And I think it actually has to be a core of how we prepare as a country for the next pandemic and not only a pandemic, any of our other health problems. Um, I, I think that if there was clear communication and proactive communication, um, we, we wouldn't be in such a bad place that we are right now. Um, our science wouldn't have been um, polarized as much, our message not as polarized. And I think a whole lot more people would be alive today because of that. And um, I wish that there was a whole lot more advancement on, on that end as well, the more behavioral psychological advancement. Yes, because I think it's more than communication. It really requires a study of, as you said, how people think and react under stress. And and I just don't see enough of that out there uh, unless I'm missing it. Um, no, and there's, you know, people and scientists, uh, you know, especially social and behavioral scientists have been, for example, studying vaccine hesitancy for decades. And it continues to amaze me that um, everyone was surprised when people didn't want this new vaccine um, and we didn't leverage those tools or that science that we had before to uh, get people educated about this new vaccine um, before it was even rolled out. So again, a reactive rather than proactive. And I really wish that that science, the more social sciences, um, was leveraged even stronger uh, during this pandemic, not just the biomedical side. You know, speaking of science, uh, let's turn to epidemiology as a science. Um, I, it's been somewhat frustrating for me uh, because epidemiology is the study of populations, whereas we have the ability now to study things at the individual level. As you know, we uh, started in the early weeks of the pandemic, ability to take data from everyone's smartwatch and fitness band, no matter what manufacturer, and be able to define where there's a cluster of cases or whether there's predictors of long COVID or even of seeing a vaccination response that the body's churning, even though the person has zero symptoms, that sort of thing. But we don't take advantage of that. We don't provide for each person on their smartphone, uh, individualized real-time risk assessment. To me, that's upending epidemiology. It's like reverse epidemiology at the individual granular level. Why don't we push for that? And why is there just this whole idea of digital surveillance just get dissed? I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it's, I agree. You know, we have some incredible technology. I mean, and, and we could have the ability to really get ahead of this. Um, you know, and we haven't leveraged that. And I don't know if it's because we have a serious trust issue in this country about surveillance um, or if it's because of privacy concerns. I don't know why, but I do know that science is happening. It just hasn't been widely disseminated or uh, implemented. Um, and again, could be part of this preparedness going forward. I just haven't seen that conversation come to the table. There's a lot of talk about the end of the epidemic, uh, you know, and I, I think it's a little naive because if anything, the epidemic has shown us that it's not going to simply end. And I know you've written eloquently about, about that very concept, but I'm curious how both of you answer that question when you're faced with predicting what the next six months might look like or what next winter will look like. How I answer it is that the vi one thing I've learned uh, during this pandemic is uh, to approach the virus with humility <laughs> and uh, that we don't know where this is going to go. I think we all have a lot of great hypotheses, um, but at the end of the day, we're, uh, we need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And um that's typically how I answer uh, in the short form. Um, I, I think this is going to be a part of our life. It's not going to burn out. And we need to learn what that means um, and try to 
do all we can to uh, lose less lives going forward. And just uh, finishing up, I wanted to get back to the disinformation and misinformation. And recently we've just gone through the Joe Rogan, Spotify, Robert Malone stuff. And uh, uh, you write your newsletter on Substack, which is also uh, shared, uh, shared authors uh, on that platform, like with Robert Malone, uh, who is the calls himself the inventor of the mRNA vaccines, which obviously he was not. It's a fraud. But also, you know, other people like Alex Berenson and uh, uh, countless number of people who are the proponents of the largest uh, um, conduits of misinformation and seemingly purposeful disinformation. I wonder if you could comment about that and what should a platform uh, have censorship when it comes down to public health matters like this, we're putting people at risk. Yeah, this has been um, a really tough internal battle that I have been going through because, yeah, I, that's a platform I use is Substack. And um, they've been incredibly supportive in my work and echoing that work. I think that uh, they, their solution, which is uh, to not censor, is a risky one, I will say. Um, I, it only risks... Uh, people's health and lives. Um, it also risks uh, selfishly my personal safety um, because a lot of those followers are the cause of death threats that I'm getting and why I need security at my office and why, you know, all of all that stuff. And so um, I think it's risky. I will say though that I do not like complaining without a solution. And I don't know what the solution is to this. I hear that if they, if Spotify, if Substack closes it, they're going to go to another platform. And I agree with they would. Um, and so how do you stop this spiraling out? Um, and I don't have a solution. I don't know. Um, and so I am open to them trying this out, but I was very clear to them when they emailed me and gave me the heads up. Uh, that uh, it was very risky. And I, I don't think I would have taken that risk. Um, but I also, again, don't have a solution. Yeah, I implored the founders of Substack to, you know, draw the line on the medical matters and, you know, not have censorship otherwise. But this is just so different. I also wonder, you know, I know you've had death threats. I, I, I have also, uh, yesterday I got an email saying you will die soon. Uh, it was really a great way to start off my morning. Um, and I had to refer that to the local FBI because it actually had the person's name and easily traceable. Um, and it gets my family gets very scared. How do you deal with all these death threats? Because this is so sick that we're trying to help people, yet we get death threats. Yeah, I don't, I don't, how do I deal with it? Um, I, my university is incredibly supportive of all of this. So I have security at my front door. Um, they uh, scan all of the packages that come to our 15th floor building because of me. Um, but it's, uh, so, so I have a lot of support that way. Um, I have been doxxed, which means all of my personal information was published on InfoWars or a, uh, a disinformation online system. And so thankfully it was quote unquote, just my work stuff. Um, it hasn't been my personal stuff yet. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly scary. I've had friends in this same space that actually had to move houses because they started showing up at her door. And so um, I, I think one of these days someone's going to get hurt. I don't know who that person will be, but it is very scary and it's a very real threat and um, it can be very tolling. And there's a point where you kind of ask yourself, is it worth it or not? And to me, it's still worth it, but maybe tomorrow it won't be. I don't know. Um, it's, it's taxing. And wow. a lot of scientists are experiencing this, right? Yeah. Like 15% yeah. of scientists said they were experiencing this kind of stuff throughout the pandemic. And it's just unacceptable. I must say that uh, as someone who's not as much in the public eye around this issue as you both are. I'm just in awe of both of you and of all the people out there who, you know, put themselves out there and speak, frankly. Um, whenever I sort of 
delve back into COVID uh, by, by reading Eric's tweets and your <laughs> newsletter, I'm always struck in the interval that I haven't picked it up, how far we actually have come. So I, I'd like to sort of maybe in our winding down point out the, the just the wonderful sense I have that for all the uncertainties, we have many vaccine candidates, we have a pan vaccine candidates, we have many therapeutics, you know, nucleotides and produce inhibitors in, in addition to monoclonal antibodies. So despite everything, we're in a much better place than we might have been uh, as a tribute to science and as a tribute to people like you. So thanks to both of you really for being courageous and speaking out. That's what this, that's what this needs. And thank you. Yeah, you know, I think it's a team effort, right? Everyone's kind of playing their role and um, helping get us through this pandemic. And because of that, we've gotten really far. Um, I think that when we're responding in a crisis, we neglect to understand or communicate how far we've gone, especially with public health, because when public health works, it's invisible. Um, it's very different than medicine, for example. And so um, it, it's important to recognize that, um, to recognize that, yeah, we've saved 1 million lives in the United States because of our vaccines. I mean, that's and that's in, that's just insane um, wow. and fantastic and something we really truly still need to we need to celebrate because that was a team effort. Yeah, and just think we could have saved hundreds of thousands more if we gotten better vaccinations and better boosters. But the other thing that's a miracle, uh, not only the high level of efficacy of these vaccines so quickly, but also how they've held up so well to all the different evolution of the virus that that you described earlier, Caitlin. Well, just wrapping up, it's just a real, what, what a pleasure to have this conversation with you. We, we could easily go on for many hours, but we cover a lot of ground. Uh, and I think uh, we're really cheering for your continued extraordinary success because you, like few other people in the field of epidemiology are so great at, at uh, simplifying the message so that anyone can understand it, yet being data-driven yet getting the latest data out there and we admire you and your efforts and hopefully things will calm down and, and that closing part of your um, love part will be will dominate over the the, the uh, negativity and hate parts that we see out there right now that eventually the good will prevail and you <laughs> will continue in your mission to help us all so thank you so much for joining us today yeah no thanks for having me thank you Caitlin it's wonderful <laughs>